Thanks very much, Annie. I mean, um, it's been an amazing place to be part of these conversations, as you can just tell, uh, just even from that really generous kind of opening to the conference. And thank you very much for that, Annie, again. And I suppose whenever we were thinking about putting together this programme of events, we were thinking about who might be the best person, I mean, at an Irish context, to think about this. Um, and, and I think Fergal McGarry uh, is certainly that. Um, his name is synonymous, I think, with the political thought of the Irish Revolution, synonymous with, like, thinking about... Ireland in a global sense from sort of the years of revolution, um, but also has been a leading voice in the decade of, of commemorations or centenaries or whatever else you're having yourself as well. Um, and I, I won't speak too much, I'll just actually read out his, his bio because the more I speak, uh, the less he does, I suppose. So, so Fergal is a professor of modern Irish history at Queen's University, Belfast. He has written widely on modern Ireland, particularly on revolutionary and post-independence Ireland. He's the author of The Abbey Rebels of 1916, a Lost Revolution, um, and The Rising uh, Ireland, Easter 1916. Um, his most recent co-edited publications are Ireland 1922, Independence, Partition and Civil War, which is uh, published by the Royal Irish Academy, uh, and The Irish Revolution, A Global History, uh, published more recently by New York University Press. He's currently writing a book exploring anxieties about modernity in interwar Ireland, and is developing a two-part RTE documentary series on nation building in independent Ireland as well. Uh, Fergal has been, as I said, extensively involved in commemoration during the decade of centenaries. Uh, last year, for example, appearing at the Bugnov Seminar um, in November. And he has also advised on the development of the GPO Witness History Interpretive Centre and is a member of the Expert Advisory Group for the National Museum of Ireland's 20th Century History Galleries. Please welcome Fergal McGarry. Great. Th thanks very much for that uh, introduction, um, Stephen, and thanks to uh, Emma for uh, inviting me uh, to the uh, conference and to the organisers for putting it all uh, together. And uh, it looks like it's going to be um, a fascinating uh, few days. I particularly welcome the, the focus on the, on the, the global. Um, uh, I think one of the limitations of the decade of centenaries um, after 2016, let me see if I can get this to work. Yep, great. Um, after 2016, which saw the, the Easter Rising um, contextualised historiographically, but, but also, I think, equally importantly, true public commemoration in international uh, contexts. I think after that point, we saw a return to more insular and state-centred uh, focuses with the commemorations of the War of Independence. And so hopefully this is a moment to open back up um, again to a wider view. Um, uh, and I would argue that the way in which we've remembered Ireland's uh, revolution is actually more insular than the way in which the struggle itself was conducted by Irish uh, revolutionaries. I think probably in part because of the attainment of Irish statehood, which sort of draws us back inwards in many ways. But if you look at the revolutionary, uh, the documents from the revolutionary period, not just the Easter proclamation, you know, to the nations of the world, but also the declaration of independence, the message to the free nations, the democratic free, the democratic uh, uh, program, they all uh, um, address global audiences um, in very direct uh, ways. So I think Irish Republicans uh, sought to level the playing field against Britain by globalizing uh, their struggle, uh, which, which ultimately aimed to achieve international recognition of Irish self-determination. So in a sense, that was the, the ultimate um, objective to have Irish recognition, to have Irish the Irish Republic recognised by an international um, community. Um, so uh, I, I recently led a research project um, exploring how global factors such as the rise of Wilsonian self-determination and the collapse of empires uh, across Europe shaped Irish efforts to secure uh, independence. Um, I'm not going to say too much about that uh, topic uh, today. Um, I'm going to focus more on the theme of self-determination than the theme of uh, global. But while I'm here, uh, I do want to shamelessly plug um, this recently published book, uh, as so many of the essays in it speak to the themes of this uh, conference. So if you look at the cover, um, it depicts an Irish-American uh, activist, Mary Walsh, uh, who's picketing the British Embassy uh, at Washington, D.C. And she's been questioned by policemen with the patriotic name of Robert Emmett Doyle. And a key argument of our study um, is that analyzing the campaign for independence as a global revolutionary struggle, um, rather than a war of independence in Ireland, 
shifts our focus, not just spatially, but also directs our attention away from the military to more cultural um, and political and ideological spheres. Uh, and that includes, um, and that was the aim of the cover here, a greater focus on the role of women, given the importance of transnational uh, networks, uh, particularly universal networks, which I know the, the next uh, keynote is going to address. So universal struggles such as suffrage, um, uh, socialism, and so on, uh, played a very important, uh, people within those movements played a very important role as kind of global connectors, amplifying the Irish question to international um, audiences. So for example, the first meeting that the Irish achieve uh, with President Wilson is actually uh, achieved by, ha by Hannah Sheehy Skeffington, um, you know, uh, associated more with, with suffrage than with republicanism in this period be because of her use of international suffrage um, networks. So a, a related theme which we look at uh, in this book is the interconnectedness of international revolutionary struggles. So contributors look at how, for example, W.E.B. Du Bois and Marcus Garvey, who we're going to hear more about in the, in the next talk, responded to the Irish question. Um, and they analyse connections between Irish revolutionaries and anti-imperial or anti-colonial movements in places like Algeria, uh, India, Egypt, Korea and Russia. Uh, we also explored the limitations of revolutionary solidarities. Um, so it's not just a kind of a boosterish story of a kind of an upgrading of how the Irish saved world civilization to how you know, the Irish you know, became champions of global revolution. But we also look at some of the, the limitations to revolutionary uh, solidarity, not least in terms of how race was deployed by Irish nationalists in support of their claims to independence. You know, so Irish Republicans could both form um, alliances with Indian nationalists and Egyptian revolutionaries, and yet they could also say, are we to be the last white nation without self-determination? So I guess the overall argument of this study is that making sense of political change in Ireland requires understanding not only the, revolutionary at home, the revolution at home, but how the wider world uh, was changing and how those changes were understood by Irish Republicans um, and also by their enemies. So in my lecture today, I want to draw more on other strands of my uh, research um, on the Irish Revolution, which like that of many historians has been influenced in various ways by the decade of uh, centenaries. Uh, shortly before the centenary of Easter 1916, uh, I wrote a study exploring through a collective biography of seven rebels, uh, the relationship between the Abbey Theatre and the Irish Revolution and how that relationship was reimagined after independence. And the key theme of this uh, 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 book um, uh, was the idea of a lost uh, revolution, um, how some radical activists came to believe that the idealistic aspirations they invested in the project of nationhood were frustrated after independence. And the title of my, book, of my talk this evening comes from an interview by Helena Maloney, who you can see in the picture there in which she reflects on the failure uh, of political independence to lead to broader forms of social emancipation. And in the quote, which you can see um, here, she's disputing the idea uh, that the rising was intended as a Pearsian blood sacrifice, framing it instead as a more constructive uh, project. And that quote um, will, will reappear later at the end of this talk. So um, I want to begin by considering uh, what the lives of the seven Abbey rebels uh, I looked at tells us about the relationship between cultural activism and revolutionary uh, politics. Uh, reflecting on their revolutionary afterlives, I'll then consider why the radical impulses embodied by many of the revolutionary generation made little headway in the repressive Irish state. And then finally, I'll return to the idea, how the idea, I'll return to how the idea of a lost revolution has resurfaced during the decade of centenaries. Um, W.B. Yeats wasn't one for understatement when it came to his own achievements. Looking back on Ireland's revolution, as he neared the end of his life, 
He asked in lines learned by many generations of Irish school children, including myself, did that play of mine send out certain men the English shot? And he was referring, of course, to Kathleen Nihulahan, which was, in fact, mostly written by Lady Gregory, but Yeats was no slouch when it came to claiming the credit for the work of others, as we'll, we'll see in this talk. Now, uh, not everyone was convinced by Yeats's claim as to the transformative potential of art. If Yeats had saved his pencil lead, Paul Muldoon later wondered, would certain men have stayed in bed? For history's a twisted root with art its small translucent fruit and never the other way round. I'm a bit more sympathetic to Paul Muldoon's take, but it's a, it's a complicated issue, um, as we'll see, as to the relationship between uh, culture and art and the, the, the uh, potential of a culture to bring about um, revolution. Um, not everyone was convinced by uh, uh, Yeats's, uh, uh, sorry, uh, many of Yeats's contemporaries did take seriously um, his claims. In his memoirs, Augustine Birrell, the Irish, Irish Chief Secretary in 1916, recorded that the programme of the Abbey Theatre became to me of far more real significance than the monthly reports of the ORIC. Within days of the rising, at least one correspondent made the connection between the Abbey's romantic insurrectionary productions and the street theatre that had played out during Easter week. Has not this revolution in some sense a genesis in the Irish theatre, he wrote, when Yeats created the Irish theatre, it was with an almost uncanny knowledge of the needs and capacities of the Irish. When the radical newspaper editor, PJ Little, met Yeats uh, on the street as Dublin lay smouldering around him, he joked that he would tell the British authorities that Kathleen Nehulahan had been responsible for the rising. And most accounts of the relationship between the Abbey and the revolution focus on Yeats and Lady Gregory, the National Theatre's directors, who came from a privileged uh, Protestant Unionist uh, background. But I want to focus uh, instead on the role of culture in politicizing the Abbey's actual rebels, who coming from inner city, uh, working class, mainly Catholic nationalist backgrounds, inhabited a very different uh, world. And the seven people I want to look at very briefly, are Maureen McHooley, the Abbey's first leading lady, uh, an Irish language activist who fought with Cumann the Man at Jacob's Biscuit Factory. Uh, Patter Kearney, uh, a prop man, uh, Fenian and author of the Irish uh, National Anthem. Helena Maloney, an actor, socialist and the first female um, uh, prisoner of her generation, which was arrested for throwing stones uh, during a royal visit. Um, Sean Connolly, uh, an actor, a Dublin Corporation official, and an Irish Citizen Army uh, officer. Um, Irish volunteer Arthur Shields, significantly younger than the other six, uh, an up and coming actor uh, at the Abbey in 1916. Um, Ellen Bushell, an usher at the Abbey, who stored arms uh, and explosives in the Abbey Theatre uh, for Michael Collins' squad during the War of Independence. And stagehand and lockout uh, veteran, uh, Barney Murphy, who fought with the volunteers uh, at the Four Courts. So these were uh, the Abbey uh, rebels. Now the idea of a direct link between Yeats's Abbey and Easter 1916 became and still remains an important part of the Irish National Theatre's institutional uh, narrative. As you can see here, the, uh, the, Rabbi, the, the Abbey rebels were publicly uh, commemorated because uh, their actions reinforced this narrative. So the plaque you can see uh, on the right, uh, um, memorializes the Abbey's seven 1916 rebels. It was unveiled in 1966. And then the other uh, plaque, which you can see, uh, was unveiled in 2016, and it essentially updates the earlier memorial by including previously overlooked uh, figures. Now, the inscription on both uh, memorials, it's a hard service they take that helped me, was deliberately uh, chosen. It comes from Kathleen Nehulahan, the play which more than any other production in the Abbey's repertoire 
symbolizes the link between the cultural revival and the Irish Revolution. Um, set in 1798, the, the, the year of the French, the year of the United Irish Rebellion, the play tells the story of Michael Gillan, a young man about to be married, who comes to the aid of an old woman whose land has been uh, stolen. Michael's blood sacrifice, his willingness to help her, transforms the old woman into a young girl with the walk of a queen. It's now rarely uh, staged, um, probably because it's not a very subtle uh, play. Um, the role of Kathleen was first performed in 1902 by Maud Gaughan, uh, whose estranged husband, John McBride, was later executed for his role in leading the Easter Rising. According to the Irish party's Stephen Gwynne, Maud Gaughan's electrifying performance stirred the audience as I've never seen another audience stirred. And famously, Gwynne had asked himself whether such plays should be produced unless one was prepared for people to go out to shoot and be shot. And there were numerous connections between the play, the Abbey Theatre, and the Rising. When it was performed on the Abbey's opening night in 1904, Kathleen was played by Maura Nicooley. Uh, among the certain men whom Yeats worried that his play had sent out to die was Sean Connolly who acted in the Abbey's production of Kathleen Nuhulun shortly before the Easter Rising itself. And Connolly became the first rebel fatality when he led the Irish Citizen Army against Dublin Castle, which is a very strange kind of reprisal uh, of the fate of Robert Emmett, whom Connolly had often performed as on the stage uh, in, in, in plays in the Abbey and elsewhere. It was rumoured that the printing press that had been used to print the proclamation had been hidden by Helena Maloney uh, under the Abbey's stage, and that was the same place from where Arthur Shields had collected his rifle, where he'd hidden it on Easter Monday before he went out to fight. So, to summarise, cultural activism was central to the politicisation of the Abbey uh, rebels. Each of them shared a trajectory from involvement in cultural nationalist politics uh, to participation in separatist organizations that espoused cultural nationalism as a critique of the moderate home rule uh, party project. And then finally to membership of armed groups. So crudely summarized, uh, the Abbey rebels progressed from learning Irish to fighting for Ireland. Padder Kearney, for instance, attributed his, his politicization to William Rooney who was a key founder of the cultural revival. And Kearney subsequently joined a radical branch of the Gaelic League because of Rooney's influence. And from that branch of the Gaelic League, he was recruited into the Irish Republican Brotherhood. So culture and politics were inextricably uh, linked for Kearney, who expressed his nationalism through cultural activism. He taught Irish classes, including to Sean O'Casey. He wrote plays about 1798. He wrote sentimental ballads, including the Soldier's Song, which became the marching song of the Irish Volunteers, and as a result of that, the National Anthem. Helena Maloney attributed her decision to join Anina Naheran, Maud Gaughan's Republican Women's Organization, to her immersion in cultural influences. I'd been reading Douglas Hyde, his history and legends. She gathered all this up and made it real for me. Maureen Nicooley, who progressed from the Gaelic League to Inigna Heron, located theatre at the centre of the cultural, economic and political activism that constituted the turn of the century movement for self-determination. Dublin bristled with little national movements of every conceivable kind, cultural, artistic, literary, theatrical, political. Everyone was discussing literature and the arts. The parent group was the Gaelic League, which was non-political, but there were other bodies like Come the Nail, the forerunner of Sinn Féin, whose leader was Arthur Griffith, smaller clubs which combined social with political activities, and from the beginning, societies for the foundation of an Irish theatre. Her memoir conveys how associational culture fostered political identity and then revolutionary activism. PJ Matthews, in his book, which you can see there, has suggested that this cooperation between diverse self-help movements developed a rival sphere of 
political influence to constitutional politics, leading to the emergence of Sinn Féin in 1905. So in other words, culture created a space for, for, for radical politics. In Nina Naherent, for instance, advocated a potent uh, fusion of cultural nationalism, feminism, republicanism, and physical force separatism. Its staging of plays, in which most of our Abbey rebels performed, formed one important strand of its activism. The first production of Kathleen Nehulahan, which was staged by the Fay Brothers Irish National Dramatic Company, was performed before a small working class audience in a shabby hall on Camden Street as a fundraiser for Anina Naharan. And it was the success of that production which led to the formation of the Irish National Theatre Society, which was essentially the precursor of the Abbey uh, Theatre. Uh, and that occurred when the Fay Brothers Company joined forces with Yeats's failed Irish literary um, theatre, which was a more kind of high art experiment which, which hadn't gained traction. So in this merger, um, Yeats and Lady Gregory bring literary ambition and patronage and credibility. But the Fay Brothers Irish National Dramatic Company provides the acting talent uh, and the cooperative spirit and the commitment and the energy required to create a national theatre without uh, resources. And both groups uh, pursued the same objectives, the creation of an Irish theatre as a cultural expression of self-determination. They wanted to provide an alternative to vulgar British caricatures of the stage Irish, and they felt that a national, national theatre would promote self-respect, national improvement, and the undoing of the inferiority promoted by British rule. But at the same time, there were irreconcilable tensions between Yeats's vision and that of the Abbey rebels. For, for Yeats, art was more important than propaganda. In fact, art was the only thing that counted. For the Abbey rebels, theatre was an extension of their commitment to nationalism. It was a much more um, utilitarian, functional conception of the role of art. So when Yeats, Lady Gregory and Singh took control of the management of the Abbey Theatre, professionalising what had previously been an amateur organisation run along cooperative ideals, Maureen Akuli was one of many uh, radical nationalists who broke with the Abbey. And she devoted her subsequent stage career to amateur companies uh, run by small, uh, run by radical nationalists such as Countess uh, Markovich, Tom McDonough, and the Pierce Brothers. So these were small companies that ran small productions um, to small audiences. Helena Maloney also came into conflict with the Abbey Theatre during the lockout, preferring to act instead for politically committed amateur companies, such as the FINA players, alongside figures such as Con Colbert, uh, who, who won fame in the rising rather than on the stage. Her aim, uh, Maloney insisted, was to give dramatic expression to national political propaganda as distinct from the art for art's sake school. She was, she was very explicit about how she saw the role um, of art. So did the Abbey play a major role in radicalizing the revolutionary generation? My argument would be no, but amateur theater did. Um, this uh, uh, photograph, uh, of the cast of a small and another small amateur production on Posa, the marriage, illustrates the centrality of amateur theatre circles to revolutionary networks uh, in Dublin. So pictured from the left are Sean T. O'Kelly, a revolutionary and future Irish president, Padder Macken, killed during the rising, Sinead O'Flanagan, wife of Eamon de Valera, Michael O'Hanrahan, executed in 1916, and the author of the play and first president of Ireland, Douglas Hyde. One reason for theatre's political significance, as Nick Hooley notes here in her memoir, was the importance of the medium itself. Almost all the national clubs, literary, political or otherwise, were associated with theatrical groups. Many young nationalists appeared as players with amateur companies, and a lot of the political clubs had dramatic societies attached, either as a means of getting funds or disseminating propaganda. So again, quite, quite functional um, motivations. Theatre allowed small organisations with few resources to mount uh, performances. It required not mere, requiring not merely a writer, but a dramatic company, an audience and a physical space. Theatre lent itself to activism in a way that other art forms, like perhaps the poetry of Yeats, didn't. 
Theatre provided an outlet for radicalism at a time when revolutionary ideas were excluded from mainstream nationalist politics. And this helps to explain why the seven-man military council which organised the Rising included three playwrights, Pierce, Connolly and McDonough, and one theatre owner, Plunkett. And these advertisements uh, from the programme for the, for, from the first performance of Kathleen Houlihan illustrate how theatre was at the heart of a broader uh, cultural, economic and political movement for self-determination. Uh, in the ad for Griffith's United Irishman that you can see there, but, but, but perhaps not read, uh, it advocates not just the revolutionary Republican principles of Wolf Tone, but also the Irish language, literary and industrial movements. The ad for Anina Naharan notes its objectives as encouraging the study of Gaelic culture, supporting Irish manufacturers and discouraging the reading of low English literature and vulgar English theatre and music hall entertainments. And we'll return to that negative agenda of, of cultural nationalism um, later. Accounts in the Bureau of Military History record how other physical sites enabled overlapping networks of social, cultural and political activists to forge a dynamic associational life prior to the rising. Count Plunkett's Hardwick Street uh, building provided the location not only for the militant Irish theatre's productions, but the Dunemer Cooperative, Nafina meetings, Irish volunteers, military classes and come in a man concerts. In the weeks leading up to the rising, its stage concealed in IRB ammunition dump. Among the businesses advertised in this programme is the tobacconist shop, where as a young girl, Maureen Nicholi assisted her father. And the attendings at meetings, which were held in a room, a little room at the back of that shop, included people like Liam Mellows, who led the rising in Galway, the Citizen Army activist Michael Mullen, who inspired the shadow of a gunman's Seamus Shields, Padder Kearney, and Michael O'Hanrahan, uh, executed for his role in Easter 1916. So the importance of culture act, cultural activism lay also in its appeal to people from diverse backgrounds, politicising individuals otherwise excluded from nationalist organisations, such as women and Protestants who account for four of the seven Abbey rebels. After the Home Rule crisis that led to the formation of the Ulster and Irish volunteers, amateur theatre declined as figures such as Plunkett, McDonough and the Pierce brothers devoted their leisure time to drilling for revolution on the streets rather than enacting it on the stage. Cork Dramatic Society transformed itself into a company of the Irish volunteers, converting its theatre into a drilling hole in preparation for the event that Nick Hooley described as the greatest drama of all. Irish nationalism uh, triumphed after uh, 1916, but the state that emerged from that revolution fell short of the radical aspirations of the Abbey rebels. And that's what I want to look at in the next section of this uh, talk, the experience of, of independence. Although the Abbey rebels remained proud of their actions in 1916, the revolutionary afterlives were characterized largely by disappointment. Failing to revive her career on the stage, uh, Maury Cooley died in poverty, believing that her contribution to the Irish National Theatre had been written out of history by Yeats. Ellen Bushell died in poverty. Barney Murphy died in Dublin Union Hospital, effectively the poorhouse, after appeals by his former comrades and other charities for support went unheeded by the state. Padder Kearney's life was also scarred by poverty, alcoholism and disillusionment. A supporter of radical causes ranging from feminism to the Soviet Union, which she visited, uh, Helena Maloney became the first female president of the Irish Trade Union Congress. But she also endured marginalisation, depression and alcoholism. She believed that the free state had betrayed the egalitarian ideals of 1916. Despite helping to secure independence, she wrote in 1930, women retained their inferior status, their lower pay for equal work, their exclusion from juries and the civil service, their slum dwellings, and crowded, cold and unsanitary schools for their children. The only Abbey rebel to escape poverty was Arthur Shields, who achieved fame in Hollywood. And he can be seen here with John Ford and John Wayne on the set of The Quiet Man. Uh, but more representative of his status as a character actor uh, was his role on Tarzan, who can be seen just over his, his shoulder. 
But despite his success, Shields also found himself alienated from the Irish state. A liberal from a Protestant family background, he saw its censorship culture as a betrayal of Republican ideals. Explaining his decision to leave the Abbey in the 1930s, Shields told the journalist, I couldn't say my prayers in Gaelic. I would have been out of a job, adding, you needn't put that down. Several of the Abbey rebels recognised how the failure of the revolution was rooted in its limitations. Perhaps the time wasn't ripe for success, Helena Maloney reflected in 1935. Our people had not a widespread economic knowledge to cope with social evils. I should have hated to see Patrick Pierce as president of an Irish Republic if the misery and wretchedness of the tenements had still gone on. Padder Kearney articulated a similar class consciousness in reflecting on the limits of self-determination. We lived as revolutionists in a period of revolution. We were separatists, pure and simple, with no idea of economics or the science of politics. When the Irish people had the free choice of their own representatives in their own country, our war was ended. Naturally, we hoped it would be a republic. So crucially, even amongst these seven people, there was no consensus as to the nature of the republic they were fighting for. For Helena Maloney, a radical feminist, socialist uh, ideals and egalitarian ideals were, were paramount. Padder Kearney, a Fenian, emphasised separation from Britain and Irish unity. Maurig Nihuli was committed to the restoration of Gaelic. Arthur Shields came to abandon nationalism, coming to define freedom in terms of artistic self-expression. But the eclipse of revolutionary impulses was as much a consequence of developments after independence as the marginalisation of these radical impulses prior to Easter 1916. Revolutionary activism before the rising encompassed not just political nationalism, but broader understandings of self-determination that generated limited support after independence. After the revolution, independence became more narrowly identified with the sovereignty of the nation state. Arthur Shields spoke of a narrow nationalism alien to the spirit of the rising. And the fate of the lost revolution demonstrates how the imagined Irish nation was shaped by the harsh realities of class, gender, religion, and power after independence. Now, one explanation for this lurch to conservatism is the idea of the counter-revolution. Um, anybody who's seen Ken, Win Ken Loach's film, The Wind That Shakes the Barley, will have seen a depiction of the Civil War as a wrong turn that saw, the British saw British rule replaced by homegrown forms of oppression. After independence, church and state reinforced each other's authority to the enforcement of strict cultural and moral and gendered codes. This was most evident in the emphasis on censorship, moral legislation and efforts to control women's bodies and behaviour. But Come the Nails saw itself as imposing nationalist ideals rather than instituting a counter-revolution. Some of the most unattractive features of independence were rooted in the cultural nationalism that provided the principal ideology underpinning Irish republicanism. So as you can see here in this um, cartoon, this pre-independence cartoon titled Some Work Before Us, um, the, the, the project of nation building of independence identified national regeneration uh, with the removal of jazz, depicted here in racial terms, racist terms, uh, the removal of dance halls, the dirty press, and English novels. And this cartoon, in many respects, anticipates the, the narrow version, of the cultural protectionist version of cultural nationalism that, that wins true in independence and that is implemented um, by the Irish Free State in very um, Philistinian um, and damaging ways. Prior to the revolution, as Sean Donnelly has detailed, the idea that Irish people had been debased by British imperialism was an article of faith for many cultural nationalists and for many separatists. Michael Collins, for example, worried that the Irish had got into the habit of looking to a foreign authority, losing their self-respect, their self-reliance and their national strength. D.P. Moran, progenitor of the Irish Ireland movement, believed that the Gaelic speaker contemplates the well-dressed English speaker as a black contemplates a white man. Anxieties about the nation's capacity for self-government often characterised post-colonial states, prompting the pursuit of a moral respectability that owed much to the values of the former oppressor. 
Martin Frampton, for instance, has argued that the rejection of Anglicisation, an emphasis on morality, self-reliance, and an anti-materialist cultural politics of authenticity characterised anti-imperial revolutionary movements in Ireland, India, and Egypt. The idea that national regeneration required the promotion of civic virtue and moral character, qualities that were often presented in explicitly gendered terms, was an agenda that appealed to the Catholic Church. The corollary of the Archbishop of Tune's belief that the future of the country is bound up with the dignity and purity of the women of Ireland was the need to discipline and control those who failed to conform to these ideals. Importantly, these cultural and moral values transcended the civil war political divide. While they disagreed on much else, come the nail and Fianna Fáil sought to embed Gaelic and Catholic values in the fabric of the new state in the 1920s and the 1930s. As the Eucharistic Congress demonstrated, state builders across the civil war divide agreed on the importance of constructing and internationally projecting the identity of the nation as a Catholic state. And equally crucially, these values were shared by many Irish people. So we're not just talking about a top-down imposition by a powerful church-state nexus, the two most powerful institutions in Ireland, but we're also talking um, about a, a, a widespread uh, agreement amongst Irish people that the imposition of censorship and the imposition of Catholic morality were actually positive expressions of Irish self-determination. Uh, despite censorship, writers played an important role in gradually exposing the limitations of this vision of Ireland. Uh, the Irish writer and former revolutionary Sean O'Fallon attributed the shortcomings of his generation's conception of self-determination to their failure to define national freedom in concrete terms in favour of an attachment to an ideal of Ireland rooted in abstracts, such as the romantic Gaelic-speaking West, its hard ancestral memories, its ancient ways. And his memoir charts a fascinating intellectual journey from imperialism to nationalism to cosmopolitanism. Uh, and I'll just read this lengthy quote. Previous to 1916, I had been a contented citizen of one of the largest empires in history. Suddenly stirred by the blood spattered flag of the Irish rising, I felt as if generations of my impoverished ancestors had begun to murmur appeals to me from their graves. In that instant, I became a perfect subject for conversion to the dogma of Sinn Féin, ourselves alone, meaning that only in national separateness is there complete freedom to live, to love, to create. And then he concludes the memoir uh, by noting finally that there is no such thing as an independent nation. It took a war to teach me that obvious fact. Um, and I think that the last couple of years in particular have seen a tendency sometimes towards quite simplistic and polarised attitudes to the war of independence and to, to, to republicanism and political discourse. We can kind of blame Twitter, which, <laughs> which may, may, be go, may be on the way out. Um, but, I, it, but it's also been, I think, uh, reinforced in rows over commemoration, over the, the, the commemorating the OIC, for example. And I feel that one of the really useful, one of the really useful aspects of looking at the revolutionary generation and looking at them through time, through the course of long lives, is that it highlights the, the complexity and the, the ambivalence with which um, even committed Republicans looked back on what they had done and what they had taught and what they had um, said, um, and how they looked back with a lot of regret on the, um, the consequences of their actions or what their actions had led to, which was often um, um, uh, a vision of statehood or, or a vision of the nation which, which, which they had never imagined or conceived. Um, so, to, so to conclude this uh, talk, I just want to briefly consider how the, um, the revolutionary generation have been remembered during the decade of um, centenary. Um, the, the conflation of the Easter Rising, uh, one of the most radical episodes in Irish history, um, at least for many people, as, as you can see from the seven people that we've been thinking about today, the, the, the conflation of the Easter Rising, this very radical episode, with Catholic nationalism enabled the Irish state to legitimate, legitimize itself after independence 
paradoxically by imposing conservative values. And this process of baptizing the Fenians begins almost immediately with the depiction of the executed uh, rebel leaders, including the Protestants and the religious ones, um, as Catholic martyrs. Uh, the postcard, uh, which you can see um, on the left, uh, was sold in a shop called the Art Depot, where Maureen Akuli worked. And it was circulating through Dublin within, within weeks of the Easter Rising. Uh, it's called His Easter Offering, um, and it depicts a fallen rebel in a revealingly conventional military um, uniform. And his sacrifice uh, is mourned by a woman who's portrayed as a passive civilian rather than as a rebel. And of course, like 200 women had, had fought in the Easter Rising, but revealingly they're not depicted in the propaganda depictions um, to a great extent afterwards. And draped in the tricolour, uh, she embodies um, the Irish nation, which is a divinely blessed project. And so I'm struck by how, how quickly out of the traps these, these, um, this sort of reworking of, of, of the Easter Rising was, was occurring. In the image um, uh, on the right, Sean Connolly is depicted by the Catholic Bulletin, I think we're having a paper on that tomorrow, um, as a devout volunteer of the Irish Republican Army, rather than as a member of the Irish Citizen Army and a revolutionary um, socialist. And, and this kind of rewriting of the, the, um, the biographies of the 1916 rebels again begins within weeks of the Easter Rising. They're, they're being re represented um, differently. So this reframing of revolutionary republicanism as part of a longer struggle for faith and fatherland wasn't just imposed by priests and propagandists. Increasingly, it, it actually reflected the reality of republicanism as the IRA becomes a mass movement during the War of Independence. As the, uh, uh, illustrated by the center image, which is from a, a really interesting book called The Book of Pal Bally Kindler, drawn by an internee by the name of Michael O'Reda. And the image isn't so great, but it, it depicts a fallen soldier, you know, with Jesus hovering over him with the inscription, Faith and Fatherland. This is, a, this is a very unusual conception of republicanism to people outside Ireland, I think. In contrast to, to these depictions, a striking feature of the decade of centenaries has been the retrieval of uh, the radical ideals held by some, perhaps a minority, of the revolutionary generation as once marginal figures such as Helena Maloney were restored to the historical record and to the public memory. Uh, in part, this has been made possible by new archives, such as the Bureau of Military History and Military Service Pensions Collection, without which I couldn't have actually written about several of the rebels I, I, I studied. It's also due to publications such as Roy Foster's uh, Vivid Faces, which replaced sanitized depictions of a chaste revolutionary generation with more intimate histories, including acknowledging the prominence in revolutionary circles of women in same-sex relationships, including Helena Maloney. Historians have also drawn on family histories, uh, particularly in understanding revolutionary afterlives. My study of the Abbey Rebels was informed by biographies written by the nephews of Padder, Kearney and Maura Niculi. These second generation accounts aim to protect the reputation of revolutionaries and to win recognition for their unrewarded sacrifices by restoring their place in the historical narrative. But fascinatingly, for, 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 for students of memory anyway, the decade of centenaries has generated a wave of third generation family histories on which I've drawn to, on today to describe the grim revolutionary afterlives of several of the Abbey rebels. Colbert Kearney's memoir, for example, details the trauma, pain and resentment experienced by Padder Kearney after independence and the consequences of this for his own father. So for the third generation, the desire to testify to the impact of their own parents' revolutionary inheritance outweighed the obligation to safeguard the reputation of revolutionary heroes, which was something that was essentially done by, by a lot of the second generation uh, memoirs. Family histories centered on emotion work to a different temporal rhythm than national histories. A century is sufficiently long for the enmities of the civil war to migrate from politics to history. But as oral history projects show, such as the Irish Life and Lore project, the emotional inheritance of the revolution remains alive within families to the present day. In 2016, a century after the death of Sean Connolly, his grandson, Aina O'Congoyle, described its impact on his own family. He wrote, 
I can see lines of disturbance still trickling down in today's generation from that. My father's disturbed life in terms of his father being killed at such a young age, having to go away from his mother in the early days. I think that always stayed with him. I think it made it difficult for him to be a father of a family, which then cascaded onto our own family. So such accounts give us a sense of the personal cost of political commitment that rarely feature in the earlier sanitized narratives that emphasize sacrifice and virtue rather than disappointment and resentment. Commemoration has also contributed to a broader, more progressive reimagining of the revolution during the decade of centenaries. Although criticized following recent controversies over commemoration of the Royal Irish Constabulary and partition, the Irish state deserves some credit for its expansive framing of its commemorative program, as we, as we heard earlier, spanning over a decade rather than as in previous years, focusing on Easter Rising. And I think this allowed us to bring in a lot more social and political uh, perspectives, allowing themes like gender to become more prominent. It also shifted state commemoration from an exclusively nationalist framing to a more pluralist tone. Another strength of the programme was to shift the focus of state commemoration behind beyond ceremonies and historical reflection to encompass cultural expression, local communities and the diaspora. As you can see here in the way that, 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 that it's um, actually set up and um, governed um, by the state. Some of the most successful interventions of the decade of centenaries have stemmed from interdisciplinary collaborations between artists and archivists and academics. Site specific productions, for example, by Anu, such as this one here, Rebel Rebel, which dramatized the role of Helena Maloney and Sean Connolly in the rising, draw on archival testimony, not just to bring immediacy to our sense of the past, but also to suggest its contemporary uh, resonances. Such initiatives point to the value of history as a resource for critically examining the present, rather than simply imparting information about the past. Commemoration reorders historical time in complex ways. The past is positioned not just in relation to the present in which it's commemorated and the alternative visions of the future that such remembrance might prompt, but also in relation to other points of time between our present and the event being commemorated. Most obviously the troubles is a shadow hanging over much of our commemoration. And this idea is evoked here by Sean Hillen's intriguing photo collage of the GPO, which fig figures on the cover of the current Era Ireland special issue, which features essays by anthropologists, historians, political scientists, film, theatre, museum, archive and gender scholars. And one of the central arguments of this um, um, journal special issue is that the most powerful commemorative initiatives are those that have resisted the efforts of the Irish state to construct an agreed narrative of the past or to impose temporal boundaries demarcating the revolutionary decade from their contemporary legacy. Perhaps most obviously partition, which by its very presence in our present, uh, resist categorizations as history. Some of the most compelling commemorations have centered on gender. Um, and these have also resisted efforts to confine their ideological significance to the past. Historical research projects and exhibitions exposing what Mary McAuliffe has described as the dark gendered underbelly of Irish history have linked violence experienced by women during the Irish Revolution with the unresolved legacy of the course of policing of women's bodies by the Irish state in the form of Magdalene laundries and mother and child homes. And so I want to end with, with, with this compelling example of the potential for progressive activism arising from the blurring of boundaries between past and present that commemoration permits. One of the most unexpected commemorative moments, one that again resisted official and or, or institutional attempts to control the narrative, was the backlash to the Abbey Theatre's 2016 artistic programme, Waking the Nation. And the video made by the Abbey to promote its centenary programme centred, strangely enough, on the quotation from Helena Maloney with which I began this talk, and which you can see there in the, in, in the slide on the right. And the irony of Maloney's words being used to promote a programme that marginalised women wasn't lost in the ensuing controversy which led to the formation of Waking the Feminists, a pressure group that forced the Abbey and the wider theatre sector to acknowledge and address institutional sexism. 
Instead of commemorating 1916, one journalist observed of the controversy in the Irish Times, we are reflecting on the failed potential of 1916. One of the most successful initiatives of the decade of centenaries, this controversy reveals how, as Sarah Dibris McQuaid has recently argued in that era Ireland issue that I mentioned, commemoration has become a powerful tool for harnessing the past, for the reordering of politics in the present, and for staking out claims to the future. Rather than simply reenacting the past, the most powerful forms of commemoration, as revolutionary activists such as Helena Maloney, Helena Maloney demonstrated through their successful appropriation of 1798, draws on the energies of the past to summon alternative futures. Thanks. I'll sit here, I'll sit here, just here on the face wall. Okay, thanks very much, Virgil. That was absolutely brilliant. And it's really great also to think about the decade of commemorations as we're trying to do, I think, um, critically in that way. And you've, of course, done many things to help us along the way there, particularly towards the end, that really unexpected quote by Helena Maloney appearing that way. Um, so we have the technology, for those of you who are joining us online, uh, an iPad, apparently, that I can sort of get those, um, any questions that you ask uh, on this. So um, certainly feel free if you're joining us uh, via the, the Zoom or whatever it is. Um, to do that in the question and answer function, but if anyone in the audience has a question answer, like you to start. Uh, sorry, oh yeah, go ahead. Paul. Hello. Yeah. Um, thanks so much for, for, uh, for uh, uh, reminding of me of our incredible history. Uh, but I, I wanted to um, go back to a moment where you uh, emphasized the emergence of the two institutions, that of the state and of uh, the church uh, after uh, independence. And to the, uh, if, if I'm understanding it correctly, um, a kind of a claim that uh, the hierarchical uh, arrangements of, of, of culture within Ireland, particularly around segregation and women's rights and so forth were, were not coming from primarily from the state or from the church, but from somewhere else. I wonder if you had some kind of reflection upon where that's actually coming from, uh, if not from the, the, the imperialist powers already inherent within the Irish psyche and so forth. I, uh, I guess my argument is that quite often there's an attractive argument that the, um, the wrong turn that the revolution took was because basically the wrong crowd managed to grab control because of the circumstances of the Civil War, which was, in fairness, an imperial settlement imposed by force of arms. So it's not like I'm, I, I see there are elements to the argument that, that, that can be um, uh, persuasive. And so the circumstances of the Civil War means that you have a state that lacks legitimacy right from the outset, a large Republican minority um, alienated from that state. And so that increases its dependence on the church. And so state and church have a kind of a shared interest in asserting each other's authority. Uh, the, 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 the church explicitly saying with a, um, a joint pastoral that obedience must be given to the state and the state um, implementing the church's moral agenda. But having sketched all that, I, I think it's a little bit too neat because I think that this idea of a kind of an Irish Ireland rooted in Catholic and, and Gaelic and kind of gendered values probably wouldn't have, have, have been effective if there hadn't been a sort of a, a, a large level of kind of buy-in from, from the public, if it hadn't been a genuinely popular vision. So I suppose that's really the argument um, that I'm making, that if, if you look at the ideology of the Republican movement, it's kind of, I think, even with these seven figures, you can see it's kind of, it's diverse, it's incohate, there are perhaps contradictions and so on, but what it's most strongly rooted in in terms of an agreed ideology is the idea of an Irish Ireland. And now, you know, potentially there's different forms of that. You could have a form in which culture provides a progressive non-sectarian coming together, but, but the, the version of cultural nationalism, I think, which, which, was, which succeeded and which was probably most popular was, was the idea of a cultural nationalism that reflected the idea that Ireland was a Gaelic Catholic um, country and which in fact some of the, the, the Abbey rebels who have a lot of respect and admiration for also bought into themselves. So I suppose I'm saying yeah I mean the church and state did use this agenda in, in really problematic ways but I think it only worked because it was rooted in a genuine popular consensus. Hi. 
Oh, is this on? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm wondering if you could comment maybe on the type of culture that was made in around the 50th anniversary, uh, when it was when 1916 was still within living memory. I'm thinking in particular of Brendan Behan's The Hostage, but also the documentary, The Rocky Road to Dublin, and how maybe that differentiates from what we've seen in the whole New Year commemorations as well. Thank you. A great talk. Uh, well, this is probably a bit of a cop out, but um, I would I would recommend anyone who wants to sort of really get across 1916 to look at Roisin Higgins's book. It's it, it's it's a really strong interdisciplinary analysis of that. Um, I mean, there is a kind of there is a popular narrative of 1966, which was that it was a very patriotic, very narrowly nationalist kind of reflection, which kind of had the counter uh, um, uh, intuitive effect of kind of alienating a younger up-and-coming um, generation from that very kind of old-fashioned um, Catholic nationalism. Um, I, there's probably something to that, but I think it's, I think it's possibly overstated. I mean, Roisin's book brings out that there's actually a lot of complexity in how 1916 has been remembered, and you can see a lot of the roots of what we would later kind of call revisionism, and which is sometimes attributed just to the Troubles, how actually that's beginning to come true in the 1960s. So Sean Lamas is saying things like, the way to honour the 1916 men is to set up a business and to be economically productive and for us to get ready to, jo to join the European economic community and so on. So you're beginning to see a kind of a, a, a more kind of a an attempt to, to, to make a kind of constructive um, patriotism um, in that sense. There's another myth of 1966, which I think has been thoroughly disproved, which is the idea that in some ways it contributed to what happened um, in, in 1969. So it's a complicated, interesting kind of moment. I mean, uh, Lamas is trying to give, create a kind of modern citizenship out of it, but then de Valera, who's kind of old and I think blind by the stage, standing up and making speeches, talking about how we have to get the Fort Green field back. You know, so, so, so even, even within the state, actually, as is also true of the decade of centenaries, there isn't a, an agreement on the mean, what the meaning of 1916 should be in 1966. And if you, if you look north of the border, you know, you've, on, you've got people like Paisley, who, who kind of partly makes his reputation by agitating against commemoration of 66 uh, in, in Northern Ireland. And then you have other figures like, for example, the parade that does pl take place in West Belfast um, is led by young men who, who, who most people wouldn't have heard of at that point, Jerry Adams. And out of 66 does come a kind of a, a, a cultural fusion which, which leads to Republican clubs into a revival of Republican activism, but, but not, I would argue, to a, a kind of a direct path um, to the Troubles. So I realize that's a very ram rambling answer, but I hope I've raised some kind of points. And Roisin's book is definitely the, the, the book to read, I think, on, on 66. Can I ask no one else? Um, Uh, thanks very much, uh, Fergal, for the presentation. Um, a lot to take in. Um, unfortunately, perhaps, I have quite a different view on the whole thing. Um, That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> thanks. Because <laughs> it's not always. Um, and it's hard to know where to start. I'm, I'm an Ulster man uh, from Monaghan, from the Bother area. My mother worked in, in the north. And I, during the Troubles, I lived and worked as well in Belfast and performed and boxed and played football and so on and so forth. And for most people, I don't say that just, just for myself, for most people from the area, once the Troubles started and you come back to 66 and even before that, um, you know, the 50s would be referred to, um, the IRA in the 50s, both the campaign and so on and so forth. It was part and parcel of their life um, and still is to a great degree. Uh, so, I see it in a much wider context and a, and a longer hi history, as in most things there are roots, uh, antecedents to, you know, how things came about. And I'm surprised we'd say with Helam and Loney, I think you mentioned that she looked back to 1798. Like, and how that story was told, because 1798 was slaughter. And Catholics kill Catholics. Catholics kill Presbyterians. Presbyterians kill Catholics as well. And instead of separation, it, it, it really had the effect of going in the opposite direction. And also with bringing Catholic, Protestant into centre, it went in the opposite direction. It was the beginning of the Order of 1795, and that really led with the, the um, 
people day boys and the defenders and so on and so forth and then you know the the mostly Sorry, presbyterians I'll yeah i'll try and make it brief yeah okay so, yeah. okay but so that's a great difficulty and just one other aspect is like in the sense of using that as an inspiration it's it's because it's not the truth uh it's not well the way it's spun to me you know it doesn't stand up now okay move on to the revival and you did mention but didn't go into detail was was seen and the playboy, which I think is quite prophetic of the dangers of what was happening at the time. And to be fair to both Yeats and, and Lady Gregory, they supported him. And particularly Lady Gregory, because she didn't like the play, but she supported it against a lot of opposition. And also the Arthur Griffith wrote fairly can, can disparaging, I, I, last, last sentence, yeah. wrote fairly disparagingly about the playboy. And in a way, he was telling the truth, but they didn't want to see it. And that's when a revolutionary fervor and the rest really, you know, predominated. Thanks. Okay, sorry, sorry for that going was a very yeah. quick response. Yeah, yeah just very uh, uh, thanks for your comments. Just very uh, qu quickly pick up on the sort of the, 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 the temporality issue, which I think is really interesting. <clears throat> You know, why, why 1798? Because they could have picked up 1848 or 1867. They're also terrible failures. But nonetheless, it's because the centenary of 1798 is in 1898. And if you go to the witness statements, you've got thousands of witness statements from Republicans saying how they came to be politicized. And they all talk about, this, not them all, many of them talk about a series of events between 1898 and 1903, two royal visits, uh, activism about the Boer War, uh, the 1798 commemoration. And this, to go back to what I mentioned earlier in the look, this creates a kind of ferment of cultural political activism and out of it comes Sinn Féin. And crucially, if you were to look back in that from say 1910, you'd look back in, on, on that agitation which formed the consciousness of the revolutionary generation. You'd say, so what? You know, we're about to get home rule. That's, that's old hat. But yet you look forward to 1916 and almost all of these people who take part in 1916 were radicalized in that moment uh, a, a decade and a half before, which I just find uh, extraordinary, including six of the people I was talking about here. Shields is the exception. So there is that kind of interesting, and it brings us back to Yeats, the idea that maybe there was a long gestation, that out, out of the cultural rival, out of the cultural revival, it, that there was a shift in political consciousness, that when later circumstances uh, the Ulster Crisis, the First World War, came about and, and destabilised Ireland as it destabilised much of Europe, th that it took that direction in terms of the, um, the, 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 the rising itself. Thanks to everyone for your questions. Just to once again thank Fergal for his talk and his um, contributions afterwards as well.